Well, as most of you in the audience know, this is um, a moment in time where humans have found themselves in a perfect storm with respect to antibiotic resistance. On this first slide, we see that um, the frequency of MRSA, VRA, and Pseudomonas resistance has increased rapidly over the past 15 years, and at that same moment, the number of companies involved in researching antibiotics has plummeted from 18 to 4. And then this blue line suggests that following that is a very rapid reduction in the available drug leads. If we step back in trying to think about how we might change the paradigm of drug discovery and development, the first thing we want to do is assess how well we've done so far. And if you think about the use of broad-spectrum antibiotics, there are a number of features that make them a, not a compelling target in the future. First of all, they're ecologically unsound. There are very few lineages of bacteria that actually produce broad-spectrum antibiotics and choose to use them. Uh, their use um, by humans, particularly in food production, but also in human health and animal health, selected for massive resistance because you have immense target populations, each with your normal resistance mutation frequency, and um, you're targeting nine out of every 10 cells on your body. Our continued use and, and our overuse in a variety of uh, both agricultural and human health areas has selected for the maintenance of resistance, such that resistance is, is no longer as costly to the cell um, as it is when it first occurs. And I think most compelling, many of our most important um, antibiotics are now ineffective against many pathogens due to high levels of resistance and the fact that they can't penetrate biofilms. And finally, of course, using classical antibiotics devastates the healthy um, bioflora. The focus of this talk is to get us to think outside the box of the current paradigm for drug discovery and to ask the bacteria themselves how would they choose to interact in terms of competition with um, those organisms that they find in nature. And the answer is quite simple. They use a very targeted approach um, in sharp contrast to the broad spectrum approach that we use with classical antibiotics and um, targeted in the sense that Species of bacteria tend to target members of their own species or close relatives with things like bactericins, phage, and other small molecules. If you ask the bacteria what is their favorite weapon of choice, um, the answer is bactericins. You find them in all lineages of archaea, as far as we know, all lineages of bacteria, and there are many suggestions now that most microbial eukarya produce these as well. Some of the common bactericins you may have heard of um, in this group, many of you have worked on them, colicins, nissins, pediasins, piacins, lactosins, things of that sort. Three aspects of bactericins make them highly attractive to consideration for future drug development. And the first is indicated on this slide where I show some uropathogenic strains of E. coli assayed against a number of classical antibiotics, which are given in yellow in the slide, versus um, some novel antibiotics, bactericins, and some well-known bactericins. And what's really compelling in this slide is that you'll see that the blue columns, which are bactericins, are clustered very tightly within some of our very best antibiotics. And what I don't show on this slide, um, but is also true, that the minimum inhibitory concentrations of these bactericins are essentially as low as those for classical antibiotics. And of course, a low MIC is a good MIC. One of the reasons we feel that the bactericins will result in a reduced resistance rate is not only will they be used infrequently because you'll be targeting very specific pathogens, but also because we can very easily use them in cocktails that will require uh, the cells to generate two or possibly even three mutations to reach full resistance. And on this slide, I show you just an example of using one bactericin, colicin E9, and permuting just a few amino acid residues, um, 10 or fewer, and the resulting molecule maintains its um, MIC value. It, in some cases, it gets even nicer, but also causes the cell to have an altered specificity such that if I use a combination of E9.0, E9.1, and E9.2, the cell actually requires three mutations to generate resistance, and that results in a resistance mutation rate on the order of 10 to the minus 12th, which is clearly uh, very reasonable for use in human health settings. Many ask 
whether these bactericins can in fact be effective in vivo as their proteins, and some of them are very large proteins. And so I show this next slide where there's an in vivo study of colicins treating uropathogenic cell densities in mice. And essentially what we've done is created urinary tract infections in these mice, treated them with um, just a thousand unit dose of colicin E1, which would be the equivalent to a few micrograms total. And you can see that four of the mice, the infections were decimated um, immediately. In two of the mice, we have very good reductions in cell densities, but with one dose, it wasn't enough. And then finally, one mouse was unresponsive. So, and this is done obviously within the mouse, in its bladder, um, in urine, and the effectiveness of the colicins is very clear. So let me just end by summarizing the various advantages bactericins offer in our quest to find novel drugs for discovery and development um, for human health. First of all, they're very easy to find. As I showed on a prior slide, a phylogenetic distribution of bactericins shows that they're essentially everywhere. Second, they're highly specific. They're very targeted. And so rather than decimate the normal human microflora as we do with the use of classical antibiotics, we can target very specifically the pathogen of interest. They have low MICs, which means they're very potent. They have a long history of use in food preservation. They're active in vivo that's been shown in animal blood, in the liver, the kidney, in human serum, in the oral cavity, the intestine, for example, with urinary tract infections, and even in the blood. They're active against non-dividing and dividing cells, and they're active in biofilms, which is particularly important as we understand the importance of biofilms in many of the approaches um, opportunistic pathogens take in our body. As far as we can tell so far, there's little to no toxicity to human cells and no immune reaction. However, obviously, until we do human clinical trials, that remains to be seen. Uh, but the signs are all quite positive. There is an incredible ease of genetic manipulation and bioproduction of these proteins. They're very sturdy and, and durable. And then finally, there are a number of mechanisms to allow us to reduce the rate of resistance and increase the cost of resistance so that, first of all, resistance won't occur, but if over a long period of time of use it does occur, it will be a very costly resistance mutation to maintain.